Hi, welcome back, and thanks for joining the Two Pondering Pagans. I'm Rook. And I'm Salon, and for a minute there, I thought he forgot what his name was. It's possible. Probable. I did write it backwards, and it sounds like a demonic name. I'll have to share some time later. Mm -hmm. Mine is Nerb. 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 Mm. Um, yours would be like Sepmetkor. It is Sepmetkor. And mine would be Nalas Sitsim. Ooh, I like Sepmet. Um, so obviously we are back for our Eclipsing the Shadow discussion. We are now moving in more into the book. Um, that we're currently using uh, for this little series, uh, which is Tarot Shadow Work by Christine Jetty. Um, and so far, I'm really enjoying it. This second part, we added another 10 pages into our reading. We haven't got into the actual shadow work yet um, in this particular phase, but um, lots of really, really good information. Um, I love the way she, her style too. Agreed. And I'm going to point this out that we actually recorded this last night, but unfortunately, nobody could hear me. So we're re recording this. Was that left hand pathist of me on purpose? No, it was a total accident, but I did feel really bad. Well, what I will say is if you had done it on purpose, it didn't work because that one got canned, didn't it? Because you don't know how to upload a video to YouTube. So, my shadow's showing. My shadow is showing. The shadow is showing. Embrace it. So That's actually, I am I am kind of glad because I was really exhausted yesterday, and I feel like I'm a little bit less tired today. Like I'm a little bit you know more awake at this point, still earlier in the evening. So um, I think we should go ahead and get started. One of the things um, that you know uh, really stick out in this book is her. Um, what's the word? It's her her finesse, like you said. It's her the way she comments and the way she discusses things from a non-judgmental perspective and an open perspective, allowing you to kind of rule in your own process. And it brings in the Jungian aspect of sight, Jungian psychology. So it kind of merges that with spirit. It's a very nicely done. I mean, we're only 20 pages in and I feel very comfortable with this. I've done sh uh, shadow work before. I've done it with tarot. Um, and when I say done it, we talk about how we always will be doing shadow work. Um, it's a lifelong thing. But we're really talking about intentional, and Rook kind of coined that part. I like it, intentional shadow work, where we're sitting down and specifically using a process to look at the shadow. And I think I want to keep with that intentional process. So right now we're using this book. We'll use something different in the future. But with that, let's go ahead and move into the next section that we're in. Um, symbols and symbolic gestures. Uh, they're everywhere, right? Well, not only are they, they everywhere, but I think the biggest takeaway in this section was that symbols communicate louder than words ever can because symbols are these conglomerates of things and our mind and our bodies, uh, our dreams think in terms of symbol, right? I think that's a really, really critical piece to kind of understand that symbology is a huge part of this. It is a, a way to speak to our unconscious mind in a way that can bring things up that might not otherwise come. And guess what? Tarot is symbolic. It is. And the best tarot work comes from your heart, not intellect. It's really neat how symbols do activate your unconscious and then bring it up. And like from a tarot card or, or whatever it is, it's the biggest thing with marketing. You see a symbol or a picture, you kind of relate it to your own life or events in your own life. Mm hmm. And it helps us communicate between things. And while, you know, it's true that you can only interpret like dreams and ideas and tarot in the mind of the person, the interpreter, right? It's the she says it somewhere in here. The um, the symbolism is through the eye of the beholder, which is, you know, when you're running tarot, doing tarot for yourself or for shadow work. But um, it is the chosen language of the deeper mind. It is uh, symbols, that is. They really do set a space for um, communication across uh, languages and across dialects and across backgrounds. Again, it can mean something different to everybody, but there are some that are very archetypal or, or similar um, in many ways, shapes, or forms, but we can't assume they're always the same. Um, you know, when your logical self mind brain conscious ego is communicating with your intuitive self or your unconscious your shadow and all those other pieces of your intuitive mind that's where the changes actually happen and i think 
that tarot symbolism is one of the ways that will help us get there because our minds are going to be focused in shadow work, intentional in shadow work, and running through it. And I think that's kind of what she's getting at here with the tarot symbolism. Yeah, and <clears throat> I'm reading about that in the and the symbolism of tarot with the the shadow. You know, I found it interesting in there where she talks about a lot of um, times the tower and the devil are considered to have shadow aspects. But you brought this up last night, which people can't hear, but they can hear now. Mm-hmm. As the, about every card has a shadow. Go ahead. What was that point? Every card has a shadow. Yeah, every card has a shadow side rarely mentioned. And that, that discussion really is... Yes, the tower has some um, what we consider negative connotations, but it has just as many positive, right? And so let's say out of the major arcana, there's those two cards, the devil and death probably two, and then the tower all considered by many to have negative connotations or negative symbolism or shadowy aspects, and they do. But that doesn't mean that the other ones don't have a shadow aspect. They all do, and it's not just a reversal. The reversal might be like the tip top piece of the shadow. Um, but they all have a shadow side. And then we go further to think about like um, another thing that we discussed last night that you aren't going to be able to hear until I repeat it um, is, you know, when we look at, at the shadow, it's also really difficult to understand and recognize the positive things that are in our shadow that we put away. Um, you know, our hero guidance and complexes that are stuck in there that we can't pull out. So, um, Maybe the shadow side of the tower, which we talk about all the time, is the rebuilding of a new system, right? You can't rebuild the new system on top of the old cracked foundation until it has completely fallen apart, which is what tower often represents. Death, uh, or devil actually, often represents the things that you do to yourself that hold you back. It's almost like you're chained up, but you're the one with the key and can unchain anytime you want. You just don't recognize it. Well, that's pretty deep shadow, but on the other hand, it's revelation right it represents the revelation of yourself so you can change it so those are shadow aspects but they're positive so you can't just say like um a reversal or a specific card is positive or negative it it just is what it is and how we interpret that symbol at the time with what's going on really affects how we interact our shadow with that and how our shadow is conveyed through that symbolism in the tarot um i'm not uh, by any means a scholar on um, occult or tarot or any of those things. I'm, I feel experienced, but not a scholar. Um, my scholar is in other things, but um, what always speaks to me is symbolism and icons and things. Like even if we all look at the symbol of, or currently the icon of a little disc, right? What do we think that means? Save. Like we all know that means save in our cultural context, right? You see that little disc on the top? If you don't know anything and your computer has accidentally switched over to a language you don't understand, you know what those icons across the top means. You know how to save, open, file, and print because they all have similar icons. And those symbols are what we're looking at using the tarot to help us through that. They're obviously more complex, but same kind of idea. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. And it's one that I didn't make last night that I got to make today. Thank you. See? So it's good that I unintentionally did not have a sound on. We don't even know what happened because nothing changed. <laughs> nothing changed. I have no clue what that deal was. But anyway, um, so tarot, again, we're talking about like tarot symbolism. It conveys that um, symbolic meaning, the activities, things like the color of the card has a meaning. You know, that's really common in metaphysics that, you know, yellow is airy, red is angry and um, aggressive and or in, um, empower me, empowering. Um, you have people and attitudes and all kinds of things that can be fit, conveyed in the tarot. And we use that um, artwork and that, that process is intuitive to us. It speaks directly to our shadow and our unconscious. Yes. And one thing that um, kind of brought up the point in the reading to me too was having many options. You know, usually you think, that could be a good thing. Oh, that's like, no matter what I pick is, is, you know, nothing is going to be wrong, but too many options can actually be a problem. It could cause you to freeze, you know, and, and then two, 
why do we fear good things? Like, you know, that's something that I want to look into. Why are we scared of the positive or good? But we can quickly, you know, put ourselves down. Like, oh, God, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did that. Mm Mm-hmm. But we wouldn't say, oh, you know, I did really good with that today. Less often. Yeah, there there is some discussion uh, in quite a few different areas of psychology and in symbolism and dream work, tarot, uh, and the occult where... And we talk about it's easy to project. I think everybody does project. I think we need to be aware of it and we need to be careful. We're not manipulating through that projection um, and, you know, not deferring. There's another word where you you kind of dump your projections onto somebody else as opposed to at least being aware of them and process them because there are some positive aspects to it. But there's also the hero side of it, of the things that your hero does really well that you love and engage like Superman's power. Um, and you're not willing to admit that you also have power and strength, but it's not as good as Superman, so it's not good enough. And so that part of the shadow needs to be addressed as well, and those tarot cards will help us do that. You know, they do, this is kind of where that part was that um, symbol interpretation is in the eye of the beholder, where she's really talking about that whole, you know, every negative situation is an opportunity to grow and learn, while every positive um, area could potentially spin out of control. And that's so true. So no matter what we're looking at, whether it's a tarot card, a symbol, a dream, a discussion, a meditation, a, uh, a working where you've uh, communing or you know talking with your deity or spirit, all of those things have the potential of going either way. You're going to drive that and you're going to address that and work through that process because that's really where we need to be. And that does take us into kind of like um, when we're looking at something that's seemingly good, like you said, if we look at it, it's like, oh, this is a really good thing. I, I'm just, I can't do that. That's not, I'm not good enough to do that. That's too hard or that's not within my wheelhouse or I'm too weak. Um, that is when shadow is actually talking to us. Yeah. Um, th- like an example, what I was looking at, you know, I really wanted to get into real estate and make a change and, and, you know, flip houses, that's an example. And then I kind of got away from it and I need to finish my, um, you know, test to get the license. But I find myself thinking, oh my God, I couldn't do that. I don't know anything about it. Well, why not? I didn't know anything about doing the job I'm doing now. And it's a lot of shit to do. So why why couldn't I? I, gotta, I noticed that um, pretty recently with me. Oh, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. Well, you can learn if you want to. Yeah. And not only that, but it kind of um, took us in the reading part, that, that phrase or that comment takes me kind of through like the yin and yang, um, where we talk about, you know, we have the yes and the no, the good and the bad. And we mentioned this again a little bit uh, previously where, you know, once you start working through and practicing um, what we call balancing, Right, but it's not truly. It's it's the light side and the dark side thinking. It's practice of holding opposites, and that's kind of what yin and yang is. And it's the end of that. It's either that is good and that is bad, to everything kind of being on this continuum of um, like hot and cold. They're not opposites. Hot is the is the um, rephrase. Cold is the absence of heat. Cold doesn't actually exist. It's just less hot until it's so less hot that it feels cold because that's how we describe it, it's still the continuum of heat, right? And so it's not the left and the right, the red and the blue, the good and the bad. It's this continuum that goes off, you know, back and forth between uh, front to back. And what it does is it gives us the capability, as Christine Jetty says, it's the capacity to tolerate ambiguity and uncertainty. that is a lifelong thing for me where I've been able to tolerate that ambiguity uh, a lot lately. And even talking with my employees, we talk about, you know, I get it. This is what you want, but we have to leave space for the unknowns and the, and the, the, the things, the in-betweens and yin and yang really does talk about us looking at our dual natures and stop, you know, uh, being so angry with ourselves for not doing things the right way and allowing our, so to be compassionate to ourselves. And I know you had mentioned something yesterday about the yin and yang, about that, you know, bringing those two pieces together, the, you know, the, the yin and yang. Yeah, I can't do it, but, but that goes. 
how it fits together. And yeah, uh, compassion with ourselves. Uh, shadow work's not about fault, flame, fault finding or blame. Um, and, you know, the only requirement is the desire to be honest with yourself, not getting rid of anything. It's fully accepting all aspects of our humanity. Yeah. We just change what's no longer useful. Yep. It can't be eliminated. And that is something that's been throughout psychology. You can't eliminate the shadow because it is part of your personality and you have to be 100%. Uh, it's just whether you... Um, what did what did um, Carl Jung say, I think? Uh, and I'm going to butcher the whole, what it actually said, but it's... Um, you know, if you cut off your, your personality your, your, or your shadow, you're cutting off half of you. The difference of what you're deciding is whether you're going to deal with your shadow. It was Robert Johnson. Um, are you Richard? Jo I can't remember the name now. But anyway, you know what I mean. It was a guy that gets youngie in psychology um, who writes books. I'll find it. But it is the idea that um, either your shadow will rule you and you will be less of yourself or you will process and, and, and own your shadow. That's the name of the book, Owning Your Own Shadow. And you'll own it with dignity and be whole, including those things you may not like as much about yourself, but they're there and they're okay uh, because they exist. And we talk about a lot of that when it comes to shadow work about that whole, you know, the, the real thing is just being honest with yourself. And that, again, is something that Christine Jetty says. The only requirement for doing shadow is the desire to be honest with yourself. And now we all say and think we're always honest with ourselves, but we a, know that's not true, number one, um, because our unconscious is going to change things and move things around. But the, the truth of the matter is we're constantly going to be working on that shadow and on the things that we are trying to do to better ourselves so that we can better, you know, whatever our purpose is. So yeah, let's go back to, to talk a little bit about shadow work still and, and, and staying focused on shadow work. I think, um, well, obviously this whole thing is about shadow work, but we're talking now a little bit more specifically about our intentional shadow work. And um, big lessons are you can't eliminate it because it's part of your personality. So you, you cannot slay the shadow. Like you can't beat it and get rid of it because then you're getting rid of part of who you are and it will come back. Like there's no no option there and you fully accept all parts of yourself and then you start dealing with them and moving through them um and as uh one scarlet bales mentioned you know it can be it, it, well, it doesn't even have to be trauma it can just be behaviors and processes and things that we put away that we have felt shame about or not liked or even maybe really loved but it wasn't valued by our family when we were younger or whatever um, but Scarlett always talked, or I say always talked, but she mentioned a couple of times about, you know, big trauma or many little traumas, whatever it is, we all have shadow work that we can work through. Um, shameless plug here, uh, which we haven't even got to yet. I think I'm jumping ahead, but I really like, um, how she talks about, uh, like, um, uh, mental health being a part of this so you know when you get to the point where you might need help or you feel you might need something you get it you should ask for it you should try to get help you should try to have therapy i think therapy is good for anybody you know it's 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 important to address those aspects of yourself and to be willing to um, kind of go with it and that is something that takes courage for you to do especially if you know you have a clinical illness or uh, psychiatric illnesses or uh, mental health issues per se and maybe you're just not in the best place it you know it's not always the right moment to dive into your shadow deeply and you know to the end it's it's something you have to consider and slowly work through and be careful with have support with be willing to call those hotlines if you need them or talk to your friend and you basically change your mentality of I am mad at my shadow, I want to stab my shadow, I want my shadow gone to self-love, forgiveness of self, compassion for self, um, and getting rid of that self-hatred and self-condemnation and that shame. That's the goal. That's the lifelong goal. Right, and you could do it however you want. I like to think of, as I'm working through it, like a mind, body, and spirit, so your mind could be counseling or it could be exercises or things like that. Body could be exercise. It could be going to get a massage, going to get a pedicure. Body could be anything that you do for self-care and spirit. If you have a belief system or a path, 
to be more involved and reach out to those people. Or it could just be you on your own. Yeah. That's just one option. But I like how she did bring, as you said, the mental health part into it. And when you need help, get help. And I think one thing that she wrote in there, or a section of the book later on is um, in the appendix, how sad is too sad. You know, and it, it kind of gives some of those um, hotline numbers and resources to reach out to. Yeah, and if you remind me when I start getting to how to use the tarot shadow work, it's um, halfway through our conversation. I'm going to bring that back up because it will come back. It, it will come out because um, she goes into it there. So, cool. go ahead. Oh, is it cool? Oh yeah. So one of the other things that stuck out, like these, these are just little. Again, we're in this first chapter where it's just getting us prepared and getting ready before we go into chapter two, which is the actual prep work and then into the actual tarot shadow work. So right now we're just talking about the generics and the things around it, using Christine to kind of help us with that process. And Finn has now come into here to decide to try to annihilate the entire room. And where's he, Finn? He's gonna get a cameo. Hey Finn. This Finn, little Finn. booger. I'm a little booger. Hey Finn. He's staying in the video. Then go be good, Finn. Um, but anyway, see, so there's one section she, that like goes into healing, right? And healing is so many things, but one thing that I thought was neat in here that's different than I have thought about it before is where she says, um, where did it go? I just saw it. Uh, True healing is not the absence of disease, but the presence of insight. And I have never um, looked at it that way as a presence of insight. Of course, I looked at healing as an external thing, mostly as a nurse, because you are externally assisting somebody to heal through um, nursing and or you know, physician services, medical services. You're trying to help that healing occur. The difference is we also have internal healing and things that we do for ourselves to try to improve that process and, and gain the insight to um, our lives. And that's, I think, what she means by the presence of insight is um, true healing. Because disease is going to occur. Disease happens of state, um, states of homeostasis that your body are or are not in. Um, might classify as a clinical disease, but um, to heal isn't removing disease. It's to put it back together and to pull it all together. And to do that, what do you have to have? Well, insight. Insight into what your body is telling you, what your mind is telling you, and the courage to take that insight and make it into some action, actionable plan and kind of work through that process, which is what intentional shadow work really is. On that healing, one part that stuck out to me in the reading was um, a description of healing as being all we can be with the challenges and gifts we have. So it says, with the challenges and gifts that dual nature that we have, and I, I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, we kind of move on a little bit into um, working through the process and looking at um, something that I thought was cool. We didn't touch on it actually on the previous video, so I'm kind of glad it, it kind of came back into my notes, and that was in the shadow of star. So the star um, in traditional tarot means everlasting hope. Now, when I read tarot, it does. It's a little bit different. I don't necessarily see it that way, you know. And it's basically avoidance of negative and concentrate on the positive. To me, the star represents a path forward or a um, never lost. So instead of just like everlasting hope, it's really never lost. And that's a different perspective, just personal there. But um, if you look at the star, if the star's traditional meaning is everlasting hope, what's the shadow? It's trying to tell us something about the choices that we are making. No matter what, we can um, hope can lead to false hope, right? Fantasy, wishful thinking, living in another world, not paying attention. So that's the shadow of something that you would see as a very positive card. Um, you know, and she kind of goes through and kind of talks a little bit and, and says, sharpen your senses to what the shadow might be um, in, in these cards as you go through it. Um, and she does it with, different types of you know readings and uh, spreads and layouts versus the way that I've done it before which is basically the the journey of the major arcana as your life story um, which is how I've done it previously so this is going to be really neat to me to try this different process and it's been years since I've done that but 
I find that very important and very um, interesting about kind of looking at uh, getting back on a track that even though you don't know where you're going, you still have direction. So they are yeah. fighting on my lap and it's tickling my foot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, talking about getting through or breaking through the fantasy and wishful thinking and, and then ultimately denying the shadow, um, a part that stuck out to me, she talks about finding the shadow's hiding place because then the healing we talked about can begin so i think that's like you got to learn how to find it and how to recognize it and i'm new to it i've never done shadow work before so that's what i'm starting to do but even reading the little bit that i've read and even thinking about it it's pretty cool how you can start to recognize it mm -hmm. you can start to recognize it in, in different ways and be like ah oh. and even thinking about it and realizing it and, and calling yourself out in a good way um, helps. So I'll see what she meant, finding the shadow's hiding place so that healing can begin. Yeah. And that that's kind of goes into what shadow work can and can't do, right? So there's a point, which we talked about earlier, where you're in shadow work that, you know, you're going to have to take it a step further because you're going to be looking at things spiritually. You're going to be looking at things emotionally. Uh, psychologically mentally there's all these different things that are going to come up during shadow work um, and that combined effort she says really talks about the goal of shadow work of integration not rejection and we've talked about that quite a bit um, and probably we'll talk about it a lot more but it's really looking at um, the good qualities uh, being at uh, in an unresolved state or an unexpressed state with the bad qualities and we're divided against ourselves and when we're divided against ourselves what's the saying you know house divided itself cannot stand so it's really about not saying uh, you know oh shadow work that part of me is bad it's oh hey shadow work how did you get there who are you come with me let's go for a walk let me push you over the cliff no I'm just kidding um, and then you walk with and I you know we've said it this is kind of like my old uh, learnings that I you know years ago it's um, it's walking and talking with your shadow. It's and it's really, you know, um, I was likened to the footprints uh, poem, right? Um, and I know that's a it's a Christian poem where you know the times that you only saw one set of footprints was where I carried you. Um, when most people from a psychological or not most, but uh, another way you could see that is when there's only one set of footprints, that's when your shadow has merged with you. That's when you've accepted the full you and the all of you and the, the comprehensive you that includes all of those pieces. Um, and you're going to be feeling that on all levels through shadow work. And it's really important that you recognize the necessity of reaching out for help when something gets to a point where it's not manageable for you, or if you open a Pandora's box that you truly need therapy for, or that you need to talk to somebody professional about, that is extremely important. Too heavy when it's too much. Yeah. Um, now, I'm gonna repeat this. It's not as funny the second time around because it didn't catch you off guard, but I'm just saying, when I first read this sentence, the old saying is, pray for a better garden, be a better hoe. What'd you call me? Now, obviously, that's not what she said. She said, buy a better hoe. Makes complete sense, but it was funnier the way I read it. It's like, um, when you do shadow work, you don't just like do shadow work and say, hey, I did shadow work. It should be better now. It's, you got to do the work. You got to oh, have, about it. and you got to have the tools, right? So yeah. tarot is a tool that's going to help you to get it. So we're going to, we're going to intend for a better garden. But we're going to use a tool to help us get there and actually work on it. That takes me back to um, growing up Southern Baptist and going, to, and we were just taught to pray, pray, have faith, and pray, faith, 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 pray, pray, pray. And oftentimes I was disappointed. I was praying and I had faith, but then a lot of times nothing ever came of what I was praying for. You gotta put in the work. Yes, pray for it. Work. If you want a better job, pray for it. Do a spell about it. Have a ritual or whatever. And then send out applications. Complete the school. Get the certification done that you want to do. You can't just um, say it in the universe and it just appears. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in some manner you have to work for it. And looking back now, 
instead of just saying, you know, oh God, it was terrible. I didn't like a lot of that stuff going up as a Christian. Well, I can see why, you know, thinking you just talk to somebody in the sky or wherever in the sea and then ask them for something to get it. Well, that doesn't make sense. Mm -mm. And so when we, when we work with, um, then my, what I call the same thing, thoughts and prayers, it, uh, in my experience, it's not about asking for something to happen to you or for you. It's about refocusing your mind on the things needed to get to it uh, or put in the work to get to it. And that's, you know, I had the other day, I, somebody said, you know, what's the point of prayer? Um, prayer is stupid. Don't do it. It's ridiculous. You need to have action. And so my response was, look, I agree, um, but I can do both. And they said, well, if you're going to do the action anyway, what's the point of the prayer? I said, it responded, it was on Facebook. And, you know, my response was literally like, A, it doesn't matter as long as the action and the process occurs. But B, that prayer doesn't just exist. It puts my mind in a direction. And no matter what anybody says, it is energy. It is an expending of energy. It comes from somewhere. You know, to have a thought that is not for yourself, to pray for somebody else's well-being or somebody else's improvement or enhancement or um, comfort uh, is an act of expending energy. Don't know how it affects things. Don't know if it does. What I do know um, is that it does feel good. And so that is is part of that, um, that buy a better hoe, right? Sure, we can pray for it, but we're gonna buy a better hoe, and we're going to use that hoe because what good is a hoe if you don't use it? Her, him, her, it. Get your money's worth. But seriously, like when you think about it, tools are there for us to use, right? But what good is a tool if you don't use it? You have to put action behind it. So I think the the next uh, piece I, I really wanted to go into is the um, how to use the. Terror of shadow work. Now, it, it really is uh, sounding very booky, book ready, like it's a, a re, uh, book reviewy, I should say. Um, but we did talk a lot about shadow in the last episode, and we're going to do a lot of shadow talk here and in the future. I do want to kind of kind of put it together. You know, we're in the first chapter, running the process, kind of learning a little bit about the background and the Jungian um, psychology. So far, love what we're hearing and reading and how this is working. Um, we're going to go next into the descent into darkness, which is the next chapter. It talks about the dark goddess, how to create your sacred space, preparation for shadow work. Uh, we'll further go into the darkest hour where shadow work begins, and we start those tarot layouts and then continue on and on through that process. And I think all of those pieces are going to be really important about, you know, really working towards integrating and re um, not rejecting the shadow specifically. I don't think by the end of this um, particular book or this practice, we're going to be like, oh my God, our shadow is integrated. We're done. Yay, let's go. Um, but already, like Rook, you've said a couple of times, just the conversation has uh, provided a level of confidence and comfort and, and just almost joy to be working with the process and having a direction, an intentional, intelligent direction for shadow work um, is nice. Definitely. It, it's helped me with a, a bad case of anxiety, which is why I wanted to start this and learn more about it. And it, it, it has really, it's really helped. Um, just the, the little start to kind of have a place to start and to learn. And I like this, um, this particular work by Christine Chetty because it does have a, a magical aspect to it. I'm sure if I were Christian, I'd want a, a Christian theme to it. Or if I was something else, I, I would want that. But this is really neat. Like you said, it'll go into creating the sake. I want to. I want to meet that dark goddess. I yeah. want to and, build a shadow altar. Uh, that is exciting. One of the things I will point out, though, too, is it's really nice she also talks about the spiritual system she's like it, it doesn't have to be a specific spiritual system in this process that she uses doesn't um, it doesn't matter if you're talking about the dark crone goddess <clears throat> any goddess any god or god or the god if that's what you believe angel spirit guide christ light allah buddha she goes through all of them she's like this is not an all-inclusive list but if you practice a certain religion use it substitute that process in for what works with her um, tarot shadow work 
I'm very, very excited to, to really work through this because um, when I did shadow work before, in the end, you always feel lighter, haha, ha, pun intended, but seriously, you do feel um, more integrated. And, and when I've done it before, it was, again, using Major Arcana as the tarot, the soul's journey, the body journey. And uh, as you go through it, you get stuck in places and you have to do a lot of balancing. And I think this is different enough that it's going to give me a whole new perspective on how to work through it. Um, since I try to approach most things logically and scientifically, it's nice when um, that's not a possibility. So Yeah. So I'm excited to get into the next spot. I think that's really um, the nitty gritty of the, the process and the details we have tonight. Yeah, next it's it's really, chapter two is going to really be, I think, about prepping to do the work. Hey, my petite. Yeah. That's my petite. Mademoiselle, my petite poisset Astra. And now Finn is going to go nuts because she's on the floor. That's his girlfriend. She is, she's not really into him just yet. <laughs> so he's still courting mm. but um but anyway so yeah next uh episode is going to go into the descent into darkness the second chapter um and this is really where we're going to start doing the preparation and the process for how we can utilize uh systems to work on our um shadow with the tarot so um i guess with that you know remember if you want to see more subscribe I like to hear the comments and see the comments. That's my favorite part is what are your thoughts? Do you think this is this the stupidest thing you've ever seen? Write that. That's fine. It's a comment. It's feedback. Now yeah. put more to it than that. Don't just say this sucks. Say why it sucks so we can kind of have a conversation. Um, tell us your shadow experiences if you want to. Feel, feel free to share those or um, any other processes that you've used. Um, anything for last words? Just thank you for hanging out and checking us out and staying for a part of our journey with us. And if you watch all of them, thanks for going on it. I think it's going to be really neat. And um, thanks for hanging out. We'll thank see you. you in the next episode. Blessed be. Blessed be. Bye. Deuces, bitches. <laughs> Blessed.